Okay, today we're going to continue research. Uh, yesterday we talked about EBSCO. Today we're going to look at websites. How many of you have used websites before for projects or research? Okay, could you tell me what you did as a process of using the website? Do the you just use like Google and you typed in the topic. How did you decide what website to pick? The first one that popped up. The first one that popped up, okay. Well, for research purposes, we're going to look at websites closer than that to make sure that they're credible and we can really expect the information on them to be valid. The way that we're going to do that is we're going to look at the suffixes of the URL. What's the suffix of a word? Yeah, it's the ending, and it's the same thing here. It's really the ending of the URL. It's the extension. By looking at the meaning of each extension, we can kind of easily tell where this has been created and if we can, you know, understand that this will be valid or something that we need to look at a little bit closer. What do you think the extension .com means? You're right, it's a commercial website. This was set up so that people could have business sites, uh, conduct commerce on the web. However, anyone can buy a .com domain. If I wanted to buy a .com domain for $25, $50, I could do that. I could make it sound pretty legitimate. I could make it Moncada's Research Foundation. I could create a web page that looks very savvy with statistics and charts. I could also put fake information up there. There's no person who's going to look over it and tell me that I can't do that. In fact, there's no laws against it. So with a .com, if you're just doing a generic Google search for your topic and you're just picking the first thing that pops up, there's a chance that you could be using information that's not credible. Let's look at this as an example. Maybe you were asked to do a research project in a history class looking at explorers. If you just did a basic Google search, this could pop up, allaboutexplorers.com. Now, just glancing over this site, it actually looks decent. We've got um, tabs up here. You can search within the site itself. So it's got a search function. It's got a about, so it's got a copyright notice here. Um, it's got a teacher resources section, additional resources, so it looks pretty valid. Um, I'm going to do a drop down of all of the explorers, and there's lots of them, and I'm just going to choose Balboa. I don't know anything about Balboa. I don't remember much about Balboa. So. I look at this kind of woodcut rendition of the Balboa. It looks to be about from the 14, maybe 1400s, kind of looks similar to the era of Columbus. And I look up here and I see 1457. Again, to me that matches up pretty well. So I decide to use this site to do my research. I fail the paper. I go to my teacher, ask what's wrong. All of my information is wrong. So, had I gone to an explorer that I knew, such as Columbus, I could have easily looked at that information and realized something's wrong here. Look at that first paragraph. We obviously know Columbus was not born in 1951 in Sydney, Australia. This was created by a teacher in order to make a point to her students. She wanted them to just sit down, Google something, find this site, use it to make a point. You really have to be cautious about the sources you get online. And had we looked at the dot com, and realized anyone can create that information, we would have realized we shouldn't use that source. 
So let's look at the other sources. We know that with a dot com, obviously, we've got to be very cautious. Anybody can put anything out there. What might be a reason that you might want to access a dot com for information if this is a commercial site? Well, possibly if you're doing research on a company or business, you want to go to their official site. If you're doing a project on Nike or Apple, you would probably want to access their official site, and that would be a commerce site, a .com. But you can also check the copyright. How do you do that? Go to the home page. Let's push this out of the way. Go to the home page. Go to the bottom of the home page. You should see copyright information, terms of use, and different policies that you can back check to make sure that's Nike's official site. Big companies like Nike and Apple, they have teams to make sure that dummy sites don't pop up. However, smaller companies may not have that kind of manpower to do it. So you do have to be cautious and check and make sure it's the official site. Also, journalistic sites, meaning media outlets that have a reporter that goes out and reports on issues, um, like newspapers like the New York Times and Washington Post, or magazines like ESPN Magazine, um, Rolling Stone, Sports Illustrated. Those are journalistic sources, and those are things that you probably would use for a lot of your projects. I usually try to steer students to getting those things from EBSCO because they are housed on EBSCO. However, if you're doing a search and you find one of those sources and they pop up and you can verify that they are a journalistic source, meaning that it employs reporters and journalists to go out and report on those issues, again, go to the home page, go to the bottom, check the copyright information and make sure it's really housed on that official site. Other than that, if it's just a generic site like this, the, the first one we looked at, there are so many other websites that you can go to to get credible information. Stay away from the dot coms. We just don't know. We can't backtrack it. All right, so be very cautious with your use of dot coms. In fact, today if you find one, make sure that Either Ms. Reed or I help you look over that .com and make sure that it's either a journalistic .com or an official site of the NBA or whatever so you can use it. So be very cautious when you're using those. What about a .net? What do you think the net extension means? It is. It was originally set up for the networks that kind of comprise the internet. So think of networks as um, the telephone networks like AT&T, the actual cables that join together to make a network. Um, cable companies like Suddenlink, those were networks. However, you can sub-publish to .NETs and you can purchase the domain .NET now. So it's really just like a .com. I could purchase a .NET for 50 bucks or less and set up anything I wanted. The only reason you might want to use one of those, again, if you are doing a project where you want to access AT&T's official site, something like that, the rest of the time, again, be super cautious about using them, check the copyright information, make sure it's valid and not a dummy site. What do you think the extension EDU stands for? Education. education. What level of education? College. Yeah. This extension is only for colleges and universities. So do you think that the information published on a college and university website would be credible? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, they've got a lot at stake for putting up fictitious or un reliable information. They could lose accreditation if they were to publish that kind of thing on their website or even internally where they publish like on Marshall. 
um, iScholar is where they would also publish other information. So you can feel comfortable that they have scrutinized this information. They don't want to lose funding or accreditation. So yeah, EDUs are good sites to go through to. What about a dot gov? Yeah, it's government at what level? Yeah, federal. So federal government sites. Do you think federal government sites would be good for you to use? Yes. Yeah. In fact, the government agencies have to release so much information to the public as part of Freedom of Information Act. So um, here are some examples of some government sites that you might want to use. Of course, every agency has its own site. and you might want to look at other ones other than just these, but have you ever heard of the census? Okay, the census is an agency of the government that actually collects demographic information. That's information about a pop population. So for example, you might want to use demographic information if you're doing a research project, maybe about the heroin epidemic in um, our state. You might want to give a scope of the problem. You could go on the census and look up some of those indicators. Some of the demographic indicators on the census are things like education level, economic status, um, race, ethnicity, um, health indicators, other things. So this can kind of give a sense of scope to your issue. You can actually search on a micro level at the census. You can search the demographic statistics for Hurricane City. And if you were to do that, you can go on there right now and I think it says Hurricane City's gradu graduation rate on 2017 is like 98 point something percent. Do you know what that is talking about really? Um, 98% of the seniors graduated? Yeah, our, that's our school. We're the only high school in the town limits of, of hurricanes, so that's talking about us. So it's really interesting, I think, to go on there and look at some of the different statistics that you can look at on census, and you might want to add it to your research at some point. How many of you heard of the CDC? Okay, the CDC, of course, is the Center for Disease Control. Again, they have really incredible real-time statistics about any kind of health especially infectious disease. So if you are tracking the flu this winter, you could log on in the morning and by the evening, the statistics on their live map would have changed. You could see where the, the flu was progressing across the country. They update it constantly. So it's very interesting to look at and it also gives you some really good information, especially if you're doing something that you want to be really up to, the, up to date about, you could do that. But this one especially I want you to use, Library of Congress. Library of Congress, and I'm going to show you a little bit about it, is our nation's library. And Housed there is basically every form of communication within our country since the beginning of our country. Now they're even archiving tweets and social media posts. So you can find so much information there. And at the Library of Congress, in their digital collections, they have actually scanned old newspapers, even from little towns like ours, from the 1800s. You can go on there and log on and do all kinds of interesting research. But even better than that, there is a feature called Ask the Librarian. You can fill out a form, but you can also go here and live chat, and a researcher will help you find the information you need. So maybe if you're stuck, like you've got a couple of good sources but you can't find any more, you might want to chat with one of their researchers, and they send you links to good information. So you have professionals at your disposal to help you do the research using um, this huge collection at the Library of Congress. They've got all kinds of things here, different formats. You can kind of look over those. 
photographs, prints, audio recordings, um, just everything. Again, they're even doing social media archiving now. So use what is available to you as a citizen of the United States. You can ask a researcher to help you. So .govs are really good for you to use. EPA, Environmental Protection, um, Department of Natural Resources, there's all kinds of agencies that could be helpful to you. So, we definitely will use .govs as well. What do you think the extension MIL is for? Military. You're right, it's the <laughs> branches of military service. Do you think you could use information there? Yeah, it's really treated very much like the government sites. With the Freedom of Information Act, you have each branch of the military also releases so much information, money allocation, troop allocations, of course not classified information, but a lot of basic information. So you could use that. Now this one is a .org. What would you think that would mean? It is an organization. Specifically, it's a nonprofit organization. So you have to have status with the IRS of tax exempt before you can get a .org. Do you think you can use these? Yeah, most of them are really dedicated to a cause. Um, Redcross.org, all kinds of foundations. However, um, religious groups can and do have tax exempt status, so you also have to go to the home page and go to the bottom of the home page for your .orgs and just make sure that you know the group that this is actually registered to. And usually you'll have the tax exempt ID on that either under frequent questions, terms of use, you also have the copyright so that you can make sure that you are not using anything that would have possibly a religious bias unless you're doing um, a religious studies paper. Other than that, you'd want to make sure that it's, you're not using one of those websites. Most of these are going to be helpful. Have you ever seen anything strange like a .co? You haven't? You probably will at some time. This actually started off as a country extension for Columbia. So um, I don't know exactly when it opened up to anyone, but over the last few years, you'll see things listed as a .co. I could buy a .co, but anybody in the world can with a little bit of money. They're very cheap. It's kind of like an international .com, but you also have no idea where this person is. It could be anywhere in the world. So be very leery of that. I would just disqualify that altogether. If you're using maybe another country's website, you'll see an extension that matches with that country, like France would be FR or something that would denote that, yes, this is another country. If you're doing that kind of research for some reason, follow the same rules. Go to that country's educational institutions, government institutions, and stay away from the open, um, open platforms that you can't back check and verify. So just use the same kind of discernment with those websites too. Okay, today you have the class to um, just look for really credible websites. From now on, don't just sit down and Google something and pick the first thing. Really think about the website, where it's coming from, the information, if it's credible. Um, because from this point through the rest of high school and definitely into college, you're going to be expected to use information from the web that is valid and can be fact-checked and not just anything that's put up there. So you have to be a smart researcher. If you need any help looking over to see if one of your sort, um, websites is valid, let me know and I'll help you look at that. And definitely, if you're using something like a .com, 
Let me help you look at the copyright, make sure it's their official site, make sure you have a reason for it first off, like if you're looking at the NBA or something like that, or a journalistic source like Washington Post or New York Times or Sports Illustrated. But make sure, first of all, you have the reason to use it. Second of all, it's the real site. Okay, I'll come around and help you and